this is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and CheapGunsUSA.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today's video is just going to be a short, to the point, tabletop overview, and there is some shooting in this video, of the Colt Model 605. Now, this rifle here is actually one that I built myself, and it is entirely pretty much on reproduction parts, uh, except for maybe the furniture, and that's pretty much about it. Um, I'm going to go through in this video sort of the historical importance of the 605 um, and specifically how I built this one. A lot of people have interest in this platform just as, as doing a build for historical purposes um, and sort of go over those features. So uh, moving into this, basically, okay, so the 605 was Colt's very first attempt at a carbine. So we can go all the way to what we know today as the M4 and backtrack it to sort of starting right here. And essentially what had happened, and I've done a video on the complete historical context and development of the M16 starting from the 601 um, all the way up through the M16A1, and that video includes this rifle too, which I touched on briefly. But basically what I sort of elaborate more in that video, and there's a link in the description to that video, um, we had up until that point within the arsenals had a variety of different firearms that served many different purposes. That would be the M3 grease gun, or the M1A1 Thompson was obviously the submachine gun. We had the Browning automatic rifle, which was a, I wouldn't really call it a light machine gun, but an automatic rifle roll for support and, um, and uh, maneuverable fire, if you will. The 1919 and the 1917 were more fixed uh, light machine gun rolls, or it could actually serve more in a heavy machine gun roll position as well, as they were belt fed and had the tripods that they used. Uh, a little bit less maneuverable than the BAR. So you had your light machine guns, your heavier machine guns, your submachine guns, and then your infantry rifle. So you had a lot of different things within the ordnance department to contend with. And one of the big sort of saving graces of the M16, one of the reasons it was so important, is you could take multiples of those machine gun rolls and really bring it down into a single package. So what we have from there is a spinoff of different variations of different styles of the M16 that could be more fit into different roles, like a carbine, for example, this, or the heavy machine gun, or which would be a heavy barreled M16, or I guess that would be more of the light machine gun. Colt was really trying to capitalize on this ability to take one simple weapons platform system and adapt it to fill as multiple roles as possible. And this was Colt's first attempt of doing that in the carbine role, and we end up with the Colt 605. Now, the Colt 604, which I have here, would have been the one in model se sequence that would have come before the 605. Now you have, again, I have a very elaborate video on this, but what you have from the 604 is the original M16 variation that did not have a forward assist. And at this point in time, we have the, the uh, boss for the pivot pen, but you don't have the full fence around the magazine release. That would have been for the M16. You still had a chromed bolt carrier, and on this model you didn't have the forward assist. Now the forward assist would be added to the XM16E1, which was in every way, shape, and form identical to this, but it did have the forward assist, which is what the Army wanted on their rifles, of course the 604 being used by the Air Force. You also had the chrome bolt carrier group, you still used the Model D stock and you still had the three-pronged flash hider. Now, of course, a lot of these features would change, especially with the adoption of the M16A1, which was the first type classified and accepted variation of the M16 used by the Army, which you would have gone to a birdcage flash hider, and then the Model E stock with more of a fixed sling swivel, as well as a forward assist and a parkerized bolt with slide serrate, or with uh, forward assist serrations milled into the side of it. Uh, again, a lot more detail on that in the other video. Somewhere from the movement of the M16 or the early 604 into the XM16E1, which would have been in about the early to the mid 1960s, that's when they came out with the 605. So feature-wise, the features of the 605 are going to be very similar to what you saw on the 604, in which case you have the chrome bolt carrier group. You still have the Model D stock. The handguards are the same size and length. You have the boss here for the pivot pen but no fence around it so feature wise identical now there were two different types of the 605 upper and basically the more popular or more iconic would be this one in which this was essentially just taking the xm16 e1 upper that had a forward assist 
and just milling it off. And what you end up with is something that looks like this. Okay, so you kind of just see this, the remnants of what that would have been. Now, it would have been correct to find early 605s with the slab side upper, which the 604 would have used. So they did pull uppers from both 604 production and XM16 E1 modified production to make the uppers. The lowers would have been the same of both the XM16 E1 and the early 604 with that single boss, so on and so forth, not to beat a dead dog with a, with a stick. The modification that was, I mean, the main modification that was made, really the difference between this rifle and this rifle was very simple. They chopped the barrel off, uh, leaving it 15 inches in length from the original 20 inches in length, re-threading it, adding the three-prong flash hider, and boom, that was it. Now, that created one complication, and that is you're losing dwell time. And dwell time is the time that the bullet remains, therefore allows buildup of pressure within the barrel after it passes past the gas block. So, if you think about kind of keeping a cork in a champagne bottle and then shaking it up, you're building that pressure in there because you still have that cork on there capping the pressure. And for that period of time, it's allowing uh, stronger back pressures to build up and thus travel through the gas tube to, to cycle your action. If once immediately the bullet passes past the barrel, I'm sorry, past the gas block and exit the barrel, that sort of corking effect is gone and gases start escaping very quickly through the front of the muzzle instead of being rerouted to run the action. That is essentially the inherent problem of what is known as a dissipator system. And a dissipator system, all that really means is a carbine length barrel with a rifle length gas system. So this kept the full rifle length gas system that the original M16 would have. Now, later variations of this, which would, they would move on to the 607, would be found that if you shorten the gas system, allowing that longer dwell time past the gas block, which you see on a modern M4 today, that you sort of combat that loss of dwell time issue and it'll cycle the action more efficiently, which is why, again, they went to the 607. Now, the 607 was, again, just like this, except they actually, they chopped the barrel down. Then the handguards themselves were modified to have the same appearance but shorter. And then they had the the uh, full length stock but it was uh, able to be moved to, uh, to a collapse in an extended position. Uh, and then a moderator was added to, to some of, some of them had the three prong flash hider, some of them had a moderator here at the end. Now because of these issues and loss of dwell time and the fact that this was not really seen as that reliable of a platform, it really did not pass beyond prototype phase and they really didn't see any meaningful service. So you might say, okay, well then well, let's, what's the point of doing the video on the historical context of the 605? Well, I still think the 605 is incredibly important because it shows ingenuity and a desire to move and, and sort of further develop the existing M16 platform, which is important. And it was a starting point. It was the springboard for moving the M16 pattern into sort of the evolution into the M4 of where we know it today. Also on top of that, the dissipator setup is very popular with a lot of people. A lot of people really like that because you get the shorter recoil of a rifle length gas system um, while still maintaining a short overall profile. So some people have done that effectively. So the most effective way to do that is on the M16A1, the standard model here, your gas port or your gas hole diameter drilled into the top of the barrel was standard at 0.086 to 0.093. In order to make this more effective, you needed to open up the gas port to 0.105 to 0.110. So by opening up the gas port, any amount of gases that are allowed to still travel through the gas block and through the gas tube after the bullet has exited the barrel, a larger opening obviously will allow more gases in. So you need to have that diameter, that, that hole drilled wider so that you can get that to cycle properly. Other things that people have done is used a lighter buffer spring or a lighter buffer, things like that to make the system more reliable. Now the 605 was made in two variations. There is the 605A, which had three selector options. Now this is obviously semi-automatic, so I just have two selector options here. But on the 605A, you had safe, semi, and full auto, just like you would have been on the M16. And then you had the 605B, which had four fire selectors. You had safe, semi, auto, and burst. Or it was a safe, semi, burst, and auto, I think was the, the way that, that that moved. So you had four fire modes, which, again, uh, sort of playing with the idea of giving more versatility to the riflemen themselves and the capabilities of however many rounds they want to uh, 
to shoot. It was more of a testing idea, which didn't tend to stick on with future M16s. Now, in the modern M16s, the burst fire is, of course, what we see today. So that sort of concept, that's where it originally sort of started on the M16 platform was here with the 605. Now to talk a little bit just about the build of the 605, so it's funny because these really never left prototype phase, uh, but it's said to be that there are more reproductions like mine that I have here built by independent builders than there are actual real 605s that were ever produced. So they were used, there are some photos floating around where they were actually seen being used in training exercises and things like that during the Vietnam War era or conflict. But beyond that, there was never real any large scale issuing of this rifle at all. Maybe a few hundred were made in total, but again, probably at this point, a few thousand or thousands of these have been made. Go on Google Images and you can see all the 605s that people put together. What mine is here is a Nodak Spud 604 lower, or an XM16E1, I think is what they call it, the XM16 lower with the partial fence, which would be correct. And then this is also a Nodak Spud 605 upper. The 605 was the only variation to use this sort of milled off forward assist variation. Now remember a slab side 604 could also be correct for this rifle, but that's what I have on here, Nodak Spud parts. The entire back end of this is actual all USGI surplus, as well as the forward hand grips and uh, the pistol grip and that sort of thing. Now the barrel, what I had done here is this is a Brownells retro pencil barrel that you can get from their site, which is sold in the 20 inch barrel configuration. There is a company called Retro Arms Works owned by John Thomas, who if you go to his site and um, oh, I can't leave a link unfortunately because of YouTube's policies, but uh, just Google Retro Arms Works and you'll find them. They have all sorts of cool um, builds that he has done and he can manufacture or, or remanufacture parts for your build if you're not aware of him. Big name in the kind of the retro building community. But what he did is I sent him the Brownells M16 barrel that I had, the uh, A1 pencil barrel, which is like a black, uh, black anodized finish. And it had the fixed uh, A1 sight base in place and of course the barrel went out here. Now the one that, that Brownells sells does not come with a flash hider. This is actually a original retro uh, three-prong flash hider that I had from another build that I had done and what I did is I just sent him the barrel and the three-prong flash hider and what he did is he chopped it down he took off the front sight base and drilled the gas port hole to the proper spec of what it should be to make it function and then he threaded the barrel for me and then pinned and welded the three-prong flash hider in place which gives this barrel an overall legal length, I call that because this is pinned and welded of about 16 and a half inches, but at the crown, it's about 15, which would be correct. This would be the original and correct profile of the barrel, except of course the original is, this wouldn't have been pinned and welded, obviously. That keeps it legal, so I don't have to put a tax stamp on it. Now, some people have cut down the actual, some people have done this themselves and cut the barrel to 16 inches, threaded and then attach the three prong flash hider so that they can remove the, the flash hider if they want to so it doesn't have to be permanently affixed um, but on those that you see the barrel sticks out there's a gap of maybe about this much space and it just to me doesn't look right so I you know once the flash hider is on there I'd have no intention of taking it off so I just had him do it that way so it looks more correct um, I've taken this out and shot it as you've seen in the video so far or are about to see and it runs very well very simple and I'm surprised that this didn't uh, stay on long sort of the idea but I can only imagine maybe in fully automatic as it starts to sort of foul up uh, more quickly and of course that as you introduce more carbon to the firearm that gas port hole size will start to reduce to over time as carbon and fouling kind of gets trapped in there so that's basically it uh, thank you so much for stopping by and checking this out if you have any particular questions or if you're thinking of building your own uh, reach out to me down in the comments section. I'll be happy to answer as many of those questions as I can. Uh, if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. My name is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and CheapGunsUSA.com. Thank you so much for stopping by. We will see you next time.